So today, talking about uh, the theme today is successful people start before they're ready. Successful people start before they're ready. And I wanted to, to talk about that because, you know, we're a, we are a, a teaching that, number one, addresses that we live in a spiritual universe, which is not unique. You know, I think most traditions at, at, the, at some um, journey down that pathway believe we, we are immersed in a spiritual universe. And so our opportunity then is in understanding that is that what is our part to play? How do I fine tune my experience? How do I engage in that idea and yet keep my feet on the ground and do my work or do my, share my gift? Develop, identify, develop and share my gift which I think is such a beautiful way of ex expressing the idea that all of us have a divine purpose. All of us have been given a, a unique and powerful gift. And so then the opportunity is to awaken to that idea and, then the, and to move forward down that path. Uh, a little over 10 years ago, when I, we, I came and visited this community and looking at the possibility of moving here, what I will tell you is there were, there were if I were put in a court of law and asked to plead my my case as to why I should come here, I would not have convinced the jury of my peers. It made no sense. And yet what made sense was I knew that in my heart of hearts there was just, there was just no doubt that this was the next doorway to walk through. And, 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 and but what I had done in that time period it was the preparation of what I knew is that I was called to ministry and ministry for me is that this opportunity because I needed to do this full time in order to really embody what Holmes talked about to honor and celebrate the, the divinity within everyone. And that's a challenge. So I would say that right now I do that 51% of the time. I was reading a book by um, Barbara Brodsky the other day called Cosmic Healing, and she said, that's all we need to do is 51% of the time. Isn't that beautiful to know? 51% of the time is huge. And when she said that, I thought, wow, that takes a lot of the pressure off, doesn't it? <laughs> so, but we're here about, we are here about expanding our own divine nature. And what I've watched in my 10 years here is there's people that have been, that have come and they've dipped their, their foot into what we have to offer, and then they go out and they find another place to dip their foot in and continue to grow and expand which is a wonderful thing. We all have to go to where we are, we are uh, nourished, where we're inspired, and how we can stay inspired. But the point is, for all of us, I think we need to have practice in our life, spiritual practice. And we also need to, to not wait until the time is right. We, if we wait till we're ready, as my teacher used to say to me over and over again, because what I would do with hers, I would go in every week, I would, I would be doing my other work, and I would go in for my classwork once a week, and I would say to her, I'd come up with a new idea why I would never be a good minister. And so she would listen to me plead the case and I would have all the great arguments of how I screwed up this week and how I'm, you know, you, you really got me mis confused with somebody else. Um, and so she would laugh and go, oh yeah, I remember when I did that, which was always disappointing for me because I always wanted to say, you are right, you're not cut out for this. You just go ahead and live your life the way you're living it. But she never said that. She said, she would say to me, Patrick Cameron, if you wait till you're ready, you will wait forever. And uh, so when I found this article, it was actually on Facebook, and it's an article by James Clear entitled, Successful People Start Before They Feel Ready. And I thought, what a great talk title. Because, it, you know, for me, it's always, oh, I'm not ready. I, not one more class, just one more sermon. Just one more sermon. I just need to hear my teacher do one more sermon and I'll be ready. So maybe you came here today. Did you come here today saying, one more and I got it? This is it? This is the one? I knew you did. So hopefully I share that intention with you. Let's see what happens. You call me on Monday morning and let me know how it's going. So anyway, um, I was watching, I, I, I thought about this and I thought, hmm. And, and all of a sudden Columbus, Christopher Columbus floated into my awareness yesterday when I was sort of putting my ideas together. And, and lo and behold, Laura and I are sitting around and, and we, I turned the television set on and there was a story on Christopher Columbus. And I thought, this is perfect. Oh my gosh, talk about divine guidance. And so um, it, it, it turns out that Columbus, of course, he was Italian, as most of us know. And he was, of course, not the first one to discover North America. There are artifacts and, you know, there are, are indications people were here before. But what happened when Columbus discovered North America, the, the Internet at the time was created big enough so that everyone found out about it over a period of time. In other words, people were, cult, there was cult, cross-cultural communication going on. 
But Columbus went to Ferdinand and Isabella and he said, I believe that we can find a shorter way to the Orient because they were going over land, over the Silk Road. And so all of the great spices would come in through there and all the great cloths and silks and wonderful, wonderful things that they didn't have a lot of in Europe at the time. And so they wanted to figure out how to do this more uh, cost effective. And so Columbus said to them, I believe if we sail west, we'll find China. And I think it'll take four weeks. How he came up with that, I don't know. So anyway, they start out in the Nina de Pinta and the Santa Maria, and I think there was a fourth ship, as a matter of fact. And they get out, and they're out there five weeks, and they're sailing west, and there's nothing. And the two captains, two of the captains come to Columbus and say, I think it's time to turn around and go home. And he says, oh, guys, just a couple more days. Let's just go a couple more days. And so they said, okay, we'll go a couple more days, and then we'll turn around and we'll go home. And so, lo and behold, in a few days, and what had happened is there was a bounty for the first person to see land. I didn't know this, but the first sailor to see land, 10,000 coins, gold coins a year for the rest of their lives. And I don't know what that meant, but I'm sure it was a lot of money. And so wouldn't you imagine that everybody on that deck, every sailor on that boat was looking at the horizon quite frequently? And so, um, Rodrigo, de Terriana sounded the alarm. He saw a light off in the distance and he announced it. And they were all excited because they traveled, they were, they were sailing into the unknown. And so they landed on the island that uh, Columbus named San Salvador. And then what Columbus did though when the land was seen was he came out of his cabin and he informed Rodrigo, who thought he was going to get 10,000 coins a year for the rest of his life, and he said, well, I want to let you know that four hours ago, I saw that same flicker. Didn't know that about Columbus, did we? Now, isn't that disappointing? But you see, even greed, greed was alive then as well, right? But the point being is that it was, a, in the, the, actually the story was called the plundering of the planet. And then, of course, how the Spanish took all of the valuable metals back to Europe and used it for, to decorate their, their churches and chapels and all that stuff. But fascinating that Columbus just said, let's go, let's find this, because he knew intuitively. So he started without knowing. He started out without any assurance of a destination other than they may sail off the edge of the earth. And I thought how it is for all of us it really requires faith in all of our spiritual. Why do we do spiritual practice? Why do a meditation? Why do an affirmative prayer? Why, why open ourselves to this idea of a spiritual universe? Because many people, I hear it over and over again, don't believe in God. And they don't believe in this spiritual nature of the universe. And I'm not being critical of it. It's just that people's beliefs are people's beliefs. And I've learned long ago not to try and argue that away from them. But for those of us that sense that there's land out there, which is the metaphor for a deeper spiritual connection, we continue to sail. You know, our, our consciousness are our boats. And we continue to sail. And, and we're sailing into the unknown many times. But if we don't start, if we don't say yes to that activity, then I think our life becomes less full and vibrant. But I think spirit's everywhere present all the time. We are being done unto as, as much. And, and I think when we're on the spiritual path and we welcome it, when we, we're in that constant state of gratitude and appreciation, thank you, divine presence in my life for guiding me in this discussion today. Thank you, entities of light, for guiding me to this teaching, which is such a beautiful gift in my life that it has enhanced my, my spiritual knowing and my spiritual deepening in a way that I don't know if another tradition would have done that or I would have been guided to that. And now as I deepen in this, I realize that in all the traditions this exists. But you have to be willing to do your own spiritual work. But you have to start. And, we ha and if we wait till we're ready, we never start. There's a wonderful story that I found, on the, as I said by James Clare, called Successful People Start Before They Feel Ready. And I want to share that with you as an example of what I think this holds for us. In 1966, a dyslexic 16-year-old boy dropped out of school. And I like to just say that I think if he were not dyslexic, he probably maybe wouldn't have had this experience. So they're in the, what appears to be a handicap or a restriction or an obstacle guided him into something different and new. With the help of a friend, he started a magazine for students and made money by selling advertisements to local businesses. With only a little bit of money he, to get started, he ran the operation out of a crypt inside a local church. 
which makes sense because, I mean, six days out of the week, what's going on in a local church? Four years later, he was looking for ways to grow his small business and start selling mail order books to the students who bought the magazine. His record sold well, enough that he built his first rec record store the next year. After two years of selling records, he decided to open his own record label and recording studio. He rented the recording studio out to local artists, including one named Mike Oldfield. In that small recording studio, Oldfield created his hit song, Tubular Bells. Tub easy for me to say, Tubular Bells. If you remember The Exorcist, every time I hear that song, I mean, I, um, I always like to make sure that I have my back to the corner so I can see what's coming at me. <laughs> Which became the record label's first release. This song went, to, went on to sell over five million copies. Over the next decade, the young boy grew his record label by adding bands like the Sex Pistols, Culture Club, and the Rolling Stones. Along the way, he continued starting companies, an airline business, trains, and then mobile phones, and on and on. Almost 50 years later, there were over 400 companies under his direction. Today, that young boy who dropped out of school and kept starting things despite his inexperience and lack of knowledge is a billionaire, and his name is Richard Branson. He said, this, in the, the author of the article said, a few months ago I walked into a conference room in Moscow, Russia, and sat about 10 feet from Branson. There were 100 people around, but it felt like we were having a conversation in my living room. He was smiling and laughing. His answers seemed unrehearsed and genuine. And at one point he told the story of how he started Virgin Airlines, a tale that seemed to capture his entire approach to business and to life. Here's the version he told us as best I can remember it. I was in my late 20s, and so I had a business, but nobody knew who I was at the time. I was headed to the Virgin Islands, and I had a very pretty girl waiting for me. I mean, is that not a good incentive? I mean, the Trojan War started because of a pretty girl. So once again, beauty and that longing for connection and all of that divine urge that propels all of us is involved in this story. And so I was um, determined to get there on time. At the airport, my final flight to the Virgin Islands was canceled because of maintenance or something. It was the last flight out that night. I thought this was ridiculous. So I went and chartered a private airplane to take me to the Virgin Islands, which I did not have the money to do. And then I picked up a small blackboard and wrote Virgin Airlines $29 and went over to a group of people who had been on the flight that was canceled. I sold tickets for the rest of the seats on the chartered plane, used their money to pay for the plane, and we all went to the Virgin Islands that night. I took this photo, and there's a picture of Branson in the, in the article. After speaking with our group, Branson sat on the panel with industry experts to talk about the future of business. As everyone around him was filling the air with business buzzwords and talk about complex ideas for mapping out our future, Branson was saying things like, screw it, just get on with it. As I looked up at the panel, I realized that the person who sounded the most simplistic was also the one who was a billionaire, which prompted me to wonder, what's the difference between Branson and everyone else in the room? And here's what I think makes the difference. And I think this is worth sharing. Branson doesn't merely say things like, screw it, just get on with it. He actually lives his life that way. He dropped out of school and starts a business. He signs the Sex Pistols to a contract, to a record label, when everyone else says they're too controversial. He charters a plane when he doesn't have the money. When everyone else balks or comes up with a good reason why the time isn't right, Branson gets started. Start before you feel ready. I'm going to take a science of mind class this fall if I feel ready. Not a good excuse. I'm going to start meditating on a regular basis when I'm ready. Just start. I'm going to start doing forgiveness work, even for those people that I still hate. It doesn't matter. I'm going to start putting down the, the prejudices and biases and the things I hold against myself that are so precious to me because I know what I've done. You're just making that stuff up anyway. When everyone else balks or comes up with a good reason for why the time isn't right, Branson says, start before you feel ready. Branson is an example, an extreme example, but we could all learn something from his approach. 
If you want to summarize the habits of successful people into one phrase, it's this. Successful people start before they feel ready. If I had to be ready to come to Edmonton because I needed X amount of dollars to come here and I needed to have the assurances of X amount of members in the community and I needed to have assurances of, uh, a, that my, my partner could work and that, that my children could get into schools, all those things that, that there was no guarantee for any of that or that people would actually come and support someone speaking about these things in a way so that I could devote all my time to this because I was not allowed when I came here to do other work. So there were all those, those, those reasons to say no to that because there was, there, was no, there was no certainty to it. But I knew I was ready. And I knew I had a, someone in my life that would say to me, you know, Laura was the first person that came along in my life when, when, with ministry in a meaningful way when I say to her, I really feel like I, I'm called to ministry full time. And she was the, the first person in my life, and she continues to be that person in my life, that said, I, th I can see you doing that. And I thought, wow, if she can see it, maybe I can start seeing it. So I had to borrow her belief. But I, I know that that was part of the intention and the consciousness that I had, was building and growing. So if, if there was ever someone who embodied the idea of starting before they felt ready to do so, it's Branson. The very name of his business empire, Virgin, was chosen because when Branson and his partners started, they were virgins when it came to business. Branson had started so many businesses, ventures, charities, and expeditions that it's simply not possible for him to have felt prepared, qualified, and ready for any of it. In fact, it is unlikely that he was qualified or prepared to start any of them at all. He has never flown an airplane and he didn't know anything about engineering of planes. But he started an airline company anyway. If you're working on something important, then you'll never feel ready. If you're working on something important, you will never feel ready. If you are working on something important, you will never feel ready. So if you feel ready, maybe what you're working on isn't that important. A uh, side effect of doing challenging work is that you're pulled by excitement and pushed by confusion at the same time. Pulled by excitement and pushed by confusion at the same time. Because whenever we're giving birth, birth to a new idea, it's confusing. But, but the call, like Columbus, like me making this huge decision, which is relatively minor in the scheme of things, to move from beautiful Southern California to beautiful Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. <laughs> It's easy to say that on a day like today, isn't it? <laughs> You're bound to feel uncertain, unprepared, and unqualified. Hallelujah. Amen. With what you have right, but he says this, but let me assure you of this, and I love this, this comes from the author. You have, what you have right now is enough. What you have right now is enough to start. No reason to have that conversation about not starting or not going down a certain path or not setting an intention and creating the invitation to have a different experience in your life. But what happens is that, and, and, and Llewellyn Von Lee talks about it in his book, uh, uh, Spiritual Power. It's interesting, before I went to Abhijani, I have several Llewellyn Von Lee books. He's a Sufi mystic, and Laura and I have gone to his uh, meditation retreats a few times. And I bought these books and I read them and then I thought, I'm never going to read these again. So I put them on my desk before I left for Brazil and I thought, I'll just give them to somebody. And I got back and I said, you know what, I need to read these books again. Because he writes at such a deep level. He writes at such a profoundly deep level of spiritual experience. He's a, he's a Sufi mystic, which means that he's, he does a, a meditation practice consistently day in and day out. And he's, he's, in, a, 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 he's in a level of awareness and, and, and communication with that unseen force for good. And he says, any, in this, and I love this, he said, any individual who has experienced a transition to a different level of awareness knows how destabilizing it can be. And see, that's why we need to come together. That's why I need community, because a lot of times in my transformation uh, makes me shake and quiver. It brings me to my knees. And if I'm doing it alone, my chances of continuing, probably, they, they're not good. Patterns of identity, notions of self are swept away or dissolved. And so are patterns of control. One's relationship to oneself, to others, and to the outer world are changed by forces that are not yet fully integrated. There can be both unexpected joy and unexpected sadness as deep feelings are released. That's, the, that's that dark night of the soul that John of the Cross talks about. And so part of the spiritual training is learning to live with such changes, to learn to live with the changes. 
See, at the deepest level of why we're together, this is, I think this speaks to this. To go with the flow that comes from within and always brings the unexpected. In many instances, instances, the only form of preparation is to know that one cannot be prepared. But what it, what it requires is to start, even though we don't feel prepared. I couldn't do that. I'm not that spiritual. Yet there's a deep wonder as the horizon expands, as a previous self, uh, sense of self gives way to a new and richer perspective on life and the divine. And so I share this with you because that's been my experience. There's been trembling involved. There's been times when I've, I've been asked to do things that I didn't feel ready. We're looking right now within our community to, uh, you know, what do we want to do? What do we want to look like in 15, 20 more years? I, you know, I love what I do, and I want to do this for, for as long as I can well. And so I look at, okay, am I going to do this 10 more years? I think so. Am I going to do another 20 years? That'd be, that'd be sweet. But it's got to be meaningful, and I've got to continue to grow. And I, See, because you cannot take anyone. When you're in, when you're in mentorship or you're in um, a, a, an idea of coaching or, or nurturing a, a different possibility, you, you can't take anyone where you haven't gone because they know. They know in their heart. You can pretend. And, but so we've been talking about facility. We've been talking about program, and we've looked at it. And, and so there's a lot of confusion because when you look at... We had a banner year a few years ago where we really had huge numbers of attendance and money. And we've backed up from that over the past couple years. And so it's easy to look at that and go, oh, well, the, the pattern is, is, is shrinking. And I don't think the pattern is shrinking. Those, those numbers, I think it's unrealistic to say our, that's our benchmark because it really hasn't shrunk that much. We have done quite well over the last 10 years because when I came here, it was tiny. And, and, and so it's been a wonderful uh, way to look at it. But what I know about moving forward, I know about the possibility is, is that what's alive within me and what, alive within the community is this sense of lack consciousness. And this is not a criticism. This is an observation. And so it's our opportunity as a movement and as a community because we are the largest New Thought community in Canada. Even though our numbers have backed up a little bit and even though, and, it, and, I'm, and I'm not talking a huge amount. But you know the idea that well, it should always grow and every year bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, you know, in some circles, just growth for the sake of growth is considered cancer. So, but what, what, what wants to happen here is a shift in consciousness for all of us individually and collectively. And so what happens is if we're going to move into the direction that I think can, can, we can even be a greater source of inspiration, a greater source of resources for people, a greater, you know, I, I, the idea floated up for me the other day that w what if we had daytime classes for mothers that had small children and you had daycare for them and they came into class? We could do that. You know, I've been here 10 years. It took me 10 years to think that one up. <laughs> okay, don't tell people that, by, by the way. But, but I'm just talking about, uh, so we're looking at this and what I know is, so there's conversation about, well, geez, we can't do that. Look at our numbers are backed up. And I said, well, our numbers haven't backed up. You weren't here when I came here when I slept in the church basement for six months. I, don't, I know, no matter how small our numbers get, I'm not sleeping back in that nursery ever again. <laughs> this is good news, because I've grown the mental equivalent of not sleeping down there anymore. But my point is, the point beyond this for ourselves and for our community is if we're gonna move in a certain direction, we need to have a mental equivalent, a spiritual prototype to look to, and then we need to go about the business of building the consciousness that supports it. So in your life, if you have a goal or a dream or an intention, but if a lack consciousness is a predominant feeling in your experience and it shows up because you don't have enough money at the end of the month and, you, you're, and nothing in your life supplies the, the abundance that is our natural way of being, as Holmes talked about, there's lack consciousness in it. So it's our opportunity to heal that, to dissolve that, to pull it up and say, you know what, I'm not going to live from that anymore. And then the behaviors that go along with that, because if I don't think there's enough in my life, then my behavior to manage that is I worry. So, so the skill that I use to manage the lack consciousness is I worry. How many people here have, have been really productive in their lives by worrying? Show of hands. One person. Okay, good. You've, and we'll talk about that later. I want to know about that. But the point, it, so it's obvious. So the opportunity then is to step into our own spiritual practice. That's why I'm so committed to the sacred healing circles. It's why I'm so committed to the small group ministries. Because those are the f foundational pieces that will allow us to create a vibrancy and a collective that will allow whatever wants to happen here to happen. But if we all sit around saying, well, we don't have enough people and we don't have enough money and we don't have enough resources and we don't have enough this and we don't have enough that, 
That is the conversation of lack. And I, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't feel, I don't take that personally. I don't think it's a, it's a failing in any way, shape, or form because that's alive on the planet. Read a newspaper. But what I'm saying is we can continue to give our energy to that or we can say, how can I dissolve the lack consciousness within myself so that I can have a greater experience of life? So that I'm not the atlas unfinished slave of Michelangelo carrying the, the weight of the world on my shoulders. That's what interests me. Because if I don't create the opening for that, if you don't create the opening for that, that, that experience in your life, nothing changes. But it's very interesting how we, we, we want to manage it. We want to have control of it. And as Llewellyn Von Lee just said, one of the things that has to go is control. But control in the sense of having to manage it and micromanage it. But if we understand we're in partnership with spirit, and that it's not all by our hand. It is a spiritual universe. And if I can capture what wants to happen because I've identified with my, my, my purpose for being alive, then I know the support and the resources, the people and every opportunity and the great ideas that want to be expressed so that the generations that come behind us can flourish and take this, this teaching to another level. I had dinner, uh, lunch with uh, the, the dean of the Holmes Institute, which is the, the, the path for teaching ministers and they're looking for campuses. And I said, what's the greatest, you know, I'm very interested in that. We're the largest New Thought community in Canada. What if we had a facility here? And, and, and as Mar Carmine has done, travel to Kelowna once a month to study. I said, what's the biggest challenge with that? And he said, money. And I looked at him and I said, we're not ready for that. And it's okay. We're just not ready for that. And it's not that we have to be ready for that. But it would be fun, I think, to be ready for that. I think it'd be wonderful to see even more people like, you watch Carmine get up here and give a prayer treatment. You think he's a little motivated about going out and making the world a better place? Yeah. And I think that's exciting. I think that's part of an outreach of our ministry. Reverend Connie Phelps was here earlier. She's going back to Kenya finally. And she wants us to bring in spiritual books. When we get 50 pounds together, we're going to ship. The center's going to ship those books to her. We're going to do several things over the next month to help support her, get her launched in her ministry there. Spiritual books, science of mind textbooks that you're not reading anymore. Uh, resources, we're all also going to support her at some level uh, in a meaningful way as I, I'm going to speak to the board at the end, our board of uh, trustees at the end of the month. But, but the point being is, if we don't start now and have the conversation and come together in deep spiritual practice, so the, the place for me to start, because I'm the spiritual leader here, is not so much about a, a plan or, or a blueprint, which we're going to do. There's nothing wrong with having a picture that you aspire to. I've been driving an old uh, Ford pickup truck that I love and I honor and it's been so faithful to me and I bless all the little people inside of it that keep it going <laughs> for 10 years now. I have a picture I carry with me now of my new vehicle. And so when I go, and it's all the resources, I have poems in there, I have talks, I have inspirational things. The first thing I look at is that car. And I go, oh, that is so cool, that's for me. And then I just turn the pages. I don't go down and buy it, because I, I, I don't want to have to make payments. You know what I mean? I want to create the consciousness so I can enjoy it, but I'm not having to do that every month. And the point is, so what I want to build, so it reminds me there's a possibility, and that's something beautiful. Is, am I going to fail if I don't have that vehicle? No. But I think, wow, I know, I'm going to use that as a template for the, uh, an intention I have around transportation. That's cool. Be neat to have that at some point in time. You know what? For a long time, and one of the reasons I know that I drive that is because there's something alive in me that believes that as a minister of this teaching, the center should go first. And if I don't example that, and if I don't drive an old piece of junk, people will think that I'm, I'm greedy. And I'm thinking, what's that all about? Because if you think I'm greedy, it's not because of my car. But that's alive in me, okay? I'm disclosing, I'm outing myself right now. But I realize that, you know, we teach prosperity, we, uh, we teach unlimited resources that we should all prosper and live an abundant life. And then I turn around and I'm driving something that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wiring together with bailing wire at times. So it's, it's a limitation in my belief that I get to heal. So that picture is to me to go, well, there you are. Are you willing to have the courage to step up and, and, and drive a vehicle that, you know, you, you, you'll feel good about? We were going to go down to uh, Reverend Norm McLeod's uh, memorial service for Reverend Catherine's um, mom. Reverend Catherine McLeod's mother passed away. And our, our other vehicle, Laura Drives, was in the, the shop. And I said, I don't know, we should probably rent a car because I don't know if I trust that thing to get us down there and back. But I looked at that in my own consciousness. I said, what that's about? That's alive in me. So there's lack of consciousness in my life. And so, you know, I can go out this afternoon and, and take on debt 
to change it, but I don't want to do that. But what I want to do is I want to shift and change the lack consciousness that's alive in me that continues to support that experience. Any of you have a new car that you feel like giving to your minister? Let me know. There's another idea that I could embody, right? <laughs> I'm just saying, but we all do these things, do we not? And so here I am making up a story in my head that I think I can impress you by, by well, and it's just silly. It's nonsense. You are bound to feel uncertain, unprepared, and unqualified. But let me assure you of this. You have, right, you, right now, what you have is enough. You can plan, delay, and revise all you want, but trust me, what you have now is enough to start. It doesn't matter if you're trying to start a business, lose weight, write a book, or achieve any number of goals. Who you are, what you have, and what you know right now is good enough to get going. We all start in the same place. No money, no resources, no contacts, and no experience. Did we not all start there? Hallelujah. Yes, we did. The difference is that some people, the winners, shall we call them that, but the people that have had a more full life, is what I would like to say, choose to start anyway. No matter where you are in the world and regardless of what you're working on, I hope you start before you feel ready. Beautiful, beautiful story. Beautiful story. So our opportunity for me as well. And so I, I hope I'm conveying to you what I know is the most important part of this whole journey of our lives. It's not about a new car. It's not about a new building. It's not about more programs. It's about the consciousness beneath and upon the new car, the new building, and the new programs that's important. Because then, as above, so below. Then we're demonstrating, as Jesus Christ of Nazareth said, I have come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And he was talking about the transformation of consciousness. And so we can get wrapped up in, in acquiring and the material things of life, but that's not the goal. Those are the, those are the effects of the, the level of consciousness that we continue to give birth to. And so as we shift and change at the depths of our consciousness, which is ongoing, there's no final destination. We're always works in progress. But when we understand that and celebrate that and understand that we're in partnership, and to say at times, not by my hand, but by God's hand. So when I look at the totality of what wants to happen here, I look within my own life and realize I long for a fuller expression of life, a greater experience of life. I want to be a, I want to be a, a, a portal and an outlet for divine expression in the clearest and most concise and beautiful way possible so other people are inspired and I help keep, uh, keep them inspired as I want to live. And so when we do that, we're about this work, then it takes on a whole different level. A whole depth of being and understanding that is quite beautiful. And we're part of that. You're part of that. You inspire me. Not just by your successes, but by the challenges you have in your life. And then the opportunity to see the divinity in the eyes of each person that we encounter. That's our work. Because it's so easy to forget. It's so easy to, to take on the judgment and that yoke of responsibility and blame and shame. And it doesn't mean we become victims or we become, become vulnerable in certain ways, but we stand in our authority. We stand in our divinity. When something shows up in our life that, that is seeking agreement with us that does not line up with our highest ideal and our highest thought possible, we can simply look it in the eye and say, this does not represent me. I choose not to do this. I'm not going down that alley with you. I'm not going to buy into and I'm not going to give you my agreement on something that I don't agree to to make you feel good about yourself. That's love. To be so clear about who you are and what you are and what you stand for. So when something in, in opposition to that shows up, when somebody says there's not enough to do that, I, you can say with love, I don't agree. There is a way. And for me to agree with you, then I give energy to, 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 that, to, the, to the disappointment of that which is seeking expression. That's what, that's what spiritual practice is. It's not agreeing with everybody. We honor all traditions. There are people in traditions on this planet that would like to see anything unlike them dead. We don't honor that. That's not tradition. That's not spirituality. That's dysfunction. That's insanity. That's evil. So don't think when we say we honor all traditions, it doesn't mean everything goes. Every, all behavior is endorsed here because some behavior is unacceptable. You know, I read about those two little kids over in the Maritimes that the snake got loose and killed them. I mean, it's a, oh my God, I'm crying. I'm sitting on my couch. Oh, oh my gosh, my, just cracked me open. And I'm sure you were cracked open by it in the family. 
my gosh, you know, things like that happen on the planet. And if you're in conscious kingdom one of consciousness, victim consciousness, you can say, how can a loving God let that happen? But when you're in the third kingdom, you understand that we are here to make choices and that God does not micromanage the planet. The snake is God, the children are God. Everything is God. And for some reason, this was visited upon this family. And I know there's a greater purpose behind it. And I know those souls are eternal. But it doesn't stop from breaking our hearts. But if I look at it from victim consciousness, like it's easy to abandon God. Because God didn't protect them. That's not the God that we're talking about. I'm talking about the immediacy of the spirit right here, right now. You and I. We are it. And it is all around us. We are part of the phalange. So it's a beautiful, beautiful opportunity. So let's start. Whatever it is, whatever we're longing, start small. You know, the, like, like Holmes said, with the indigestion, little people within me. If that's what puts you into a state of gratitude, work with that. You know, if it's a Hail Mary, use that. If it's an Our Father, use that. If it's a, if it's a chant, an Om chant, use that. Whatever gets you there, which elevates your awareness of being. It's just a, a powerful, wonderful opportunity. I want to share one last thing with you before we go, and I know I'm... I'm running late, but you know, who wants to be out in the sunshine on a day like today anyway? I'll be quick. Rumi wrote this. Rumi, a wonderful Sufi poet. He wrote this, and I think it's so true of you and I, and I want to plant this seed with you before you go. Rumi said, we must never forget this one thing, the one quality needed. There, <clears throat> there is one thing in the world which you must never forget. If you were to forget everything else and remember this, then you would have nothing at all to worry about. But if you were to remember everything else and then forget this, you would have done nothing with your life. It is as if a king sent you to a country to carry out a particular mission. You go to that country, you do a hundred different things, but if you do not perform the mission assigned to you, it is as if you have done nothing. As human beings come into this world for a particular mission, and that mission is our singular, singular purpose. If we do not enact it, we have done nothing. If you look, if you, now if you were to look, now if you were to say, look, even if I have not performed this mission, I have, after all, performed a hundred others. And that would mean nothing. You were not created for those other missions. It is as if you were to buy a sword of priceless Indian steel, such as the one usually finds only in the treasures of emperors, and were to turn it into a butcher's knife for cutting up rotten meat, saying, look, I'm not letting this sword stay unused. I'm putting it to a thousand highly useful purposes. Or it is as though you were to take a golden bowl and cook turnips in it, while for just one grain of that gold, you could purchase hundreds of pots. Or it is though you were to take a dagger of the most finely wrought and tempered steel and use it as, as a nail to hang a broken pitcher on, saying, I'm making excellent use of my dagger. I'm hanging a broken pitcher on it. When you could have hang a picture on a nail that cost a few cents, what sense does it make to use a dagger worth a fortune? And Rumi says this about all those examples. You are more you are more valuable than both heaven and earth. You are more valuable than heaven and earth. What else can I say? You do not know your own worth. Do not sell yourself at a ridiculous price. You are so valuable in God's eyes. And so it is. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Brown.